Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week, your Monday rundown of all the latest and greatest and spaciest news relating to everything space and spaceflight. And wow, what a week! So much to discuss. All over the globe, we're seeing exciting flights and previews of upcoming missions, so let's not delay the content any longer. Before setting off on our journey through the week, though, do remember to subscribe down below so that you get notified of these videos the instant they're up, so that the news we're going to talk about is as fresh as and relevant as possible. Anyway, let's take a look at everything we saw last week. So, launches last week. We had a few, but the one I think that everyone was the most excited about was the Delta IV Heavy launch. Yes! On December the 11th, the United Launch Alliance's most powerful launch vehicle and, by sheer size, the world's biggest operational rocket, finally took to the skies after months of delays, hot aborts and setbacks, all of which made seeing the triple core beast finally fly all the sweeter. This was a classified mission for the United States National Reconnaissance Office, and the payload was an Orion 10 spy satellite, though of course not much is really known about what this satellite will do, given its classified nature. I guess the United States want to keep their private affairs private and keep their secrets hidden from prying eyes. It's an understandable desire, I certainly feel the same way, but this humble YouTube channel can't really afford to launch dedicated private satellite constellations, so instead, I just use CyberGhost VPN! CyberGhost VPN currently helps keep over 36 million customers all over the world stay safe and anonymous. Their extensive network includes over 6,100 VPN servers across 90 different countries, and they have dedicated apps for pretty much every platform, from Fire Stick to Windows, iOS to Android TV, Every platform is covered, which is great, because one CyberGhost VPN subscription can protect up to seven devices at once, allowing you to torrent safely, harness the full potential of your streaming services by unlocking geo-restricted content on sites such as Netflix. That's because a VPN hides your IP address and encrypts your internet connection, making you anonymous and keeping you safe. The best part about CyberGhost VPN though, the price! By using my affiliate link on screen and in the video description, you can get 77% off 12 months of service plus an extra 6 months for free. CyberGhost VPN are so confident that you'll like their service, they have an extra 45 day money back guarantee as well. In a world of geo-locked content, the ever-present threat of cyber attack and the lack of privacy over public Wi-Fi, a VPN is becoming an ever more essential thing. So why not choose CyberGhost VPN? Go on, make the move, click that link in the description. <clears throat> but uh, moving on, the Delta IV Heavy was a nice sight to see. It was meant to launch on the 10th, but I guess the old girl had one more minor delay left in store for us. This is contrary to our next launch, which was also meant to take place on the 10th, but ended up flying a little earlier than expected on Wednesday, December the 9th instead. This was over in China and was a Long March 11 flight from the Zichang Launch Complex. The payload was a GCAM satellite for the Chinese Academy of Sciences, which will study gravitational wave astronomy. Its name is an acronym that stands for Gravitational Wave High Energy Electromagnetic Counterpart All Sky Monitor. Bit of a mouthful, but I guess it's descriptive. Uh, moving along, there were a few other events that took place last week. Like the Virgin Galactic flight on December the 11th. Virgin Galactic launched its spaceship to Unity from its carrier aircraft, White Knight 2, but unfortunately after being released, the spacecraft's onboard computer, which monitors the rocket motor, lost connection. This triggered an automatic fail-safe scenario that halted rocket motor ignition. Following this, the pilots gracefully glided the space plane back to Virgin Spaceport America and landed safely. While it's a shame that the vehicle never made it to space, it's great to have confirmation that safety systems work and that the aircraft is able to safely glide back to base as intended in such a scenario. Virgin Galactic are now carefully analysing the flight data to diagnose the cause of the computer communication loss and once this is done, they'll be back in the sky for another attempt, possibly even before the month is over. The final space launch of the week was a Falcon 9 carrying the SXM-7 satellite on behalf of Sirius XM Holdings Incorporated, which is an American broadcasting company. The SXM-7 and its sister, the SXM-8, are high-power broadcasting satellites for Sirius XM's digital radio service and are both equipped with large unfurlable antenna reflectors, which allow for broadcasting to radios without the need for a large receiver dish on the ground. The SXM-7 and 8 will replace the tired XM-3 and XM-4 satellites, which 
which were launched in 2005 and 2006 respectively. This mission was the second time SpaceX have flown a Falcon 9 booster for the seventh time, and the first time a commercial payload was flown on a Falcon 9 with more than four flights under its fins. The booster successfully landed around 650 kilometers downrange on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship, and the fairings were recovered by SpaceX's fairing recovery fleet as well. Anyway, those were all the space launches that we saw last week, so now it's time to head on down to Boca Chica, Texas for our regularly scheduled Starship coverage. And yes, with that, we have one of the most exciting flights of the year. After quite a few delays, we finally got to see the shiny Starship SN8 take flight to 12.5 kilometers high, higher than any previous Starship prototype up to this point. This is also the first time a Starship prototype has flown with nose cone and flaps attached. The mission was to fly the vehicle up to high altitude and then have it execute its signature belly flop maneuver and descend back down to the launch site at terminal velocity before flipping itself back into an upright position and landing itself. During the ascent, SpaceX subsequently shut off the engines, shutting down the first at around 1 minute and 40 seconds post-launch, and then the second at around 3 minutes 13. I certainly remember worrying that these two shutdowns constituted failures when I saw this live, but turns out this was what SpaceX planned to do all along. After reaching its target altitude, the SN8 then used its four massive fins to orient itself into the signature belly flop position in order to increase its surface area and therefore slow its descent speed as much as possible. This can be likened to a skydiver spreading their arms and legs out when falling. Moments before impact, all three Raptor engines reignited successfully, drawing fuel from the vehicle's header tanks and amazingly swung the spacecraft successfully into a vertical position. All was going well, right until it wasn't. Green flames erupted from the base of the rocket, the descent was way too fast, and rocket went boom. <laughs> this was due to low pressure in the fuel header tank during the landing burn, which resulted in excessively high touchdown velocity and subsequent explosion. SpaceX haven't confirmed what those green flames were, but the popular theory is that it was caused by copper components of the Raptor engines being burned, since copper burns with a green flame. <laughs> this is obviously not good, since the engine is basically destroying itself. The low pressure in the header tank can be blamed for this, loss of header tank pressure can, and apparently did, cause flame out and an imbalance of propellant in the engine combustion chamber, resulting in the self-destruct burn of that Raptor. All in all though, this flight was still a massive success for SpaceX. The mission was never expected to work flawlessly, and considering that this is really the first true test of the Starship, things went spectacularly well. SpaceX have stated that the most important part of this launch was to gather flight test data, not necessarily complete all the test objectives, and Elon Musk confirmed on Twitter that the company had acquired all of the data they needed and more, so I can't wait to see what flights we'll get to see in the future which actually transitions us nicely into the news surrounding the next Starship, the SN9. As you can see from Brendan Lewis's excellent infographic on the current state of Starships, the SN9 is also a full-size, fully built Starship prototype with the same objectives as the late SN8. SpaceX have confirmed that the SN9 is next in line for a high-altitude flight test, but on the 11th of December, its stand inside the high bay malfunctioned, resulting in a very loud bang and the vehicle tilted to one side. Luckily, nobody was hurt. The massive size and weight of this vehicle could have easily done some serious damage, but it's now unknown if the damage to the vehicle will prevent the SN9 from completing its flight. There is still hope for the SN10, which may be ready in less than a month, but if the stars align and the SN9 isn't scrapped and only needs minor repairs, then we might see the next Starship flight very soon. Only time will tell, and there are still lots of launches elsewhere to be excited about during next week, in fact which is how I'm segueing smoothly into our next segment of the show, and then subsequently ruining the transition by unapologetically stating that if you guys are enjoying the video so far, then please do leave a little like down below. It really helps us stay alive in the YouTube machine. Uh, anyway. Unfortunately, while we did have lots of launch successes last week, we did see some delays as well. The first launch we now expect to see this week will be today, December the 14th. In fact, there'll be two launches today. The first will be the second flight of the Russian Angara A5 rocket. I know it might feel like I'm crying wolf with this launch at this point since I've talked about this flight quite a bit over the last few weeks owing to its delays, but delays are always going to be expected for test vehicles. Here's hoping that the launch can finally happen this week. 
There's actually a chance that this flight has already happened since the planned launch time is about two hours before I upload this video, which sadly isn't really long enough for me to edit the video in time. The second launch of the day will be Astra's Rocket 3.2. Much like the Angara A5, this is another test vehicle and as such there isn't a payload. Rocket 3.2 builds upon the progress of its predecessor, Rocket 3.1, which sadly failed to reach orbit after a failure with its first stage during its flight. We had hoped to see Rocket 3.2 fly last week, but Astra's Alaskan launch site is particularly prone to bad weather, and the area experienced some extreme upper level wind shear and triggered lightning. Hopefully the mission succeeds today, but if not then Astra have confirmed that they have daily launch opportunities through to December 18th. The third launch of the week will be tomorrow, December the 15th, and will be the Owl's Night Begins mission from Rocket Lab. This, as always, will be an Electron rocket and will be taking flight from the Mahia Peninsula launch site in New Zealand. The payload will be the Strix Alpha satellite on behalf of Japanese Earth imaging company Synspective, and the mission's name, the Owl's Night Begins, is a tribute to the Strix satellite's ability to image millimeter level changes to the Earth's surface from space, independent of weather conditions and at any time of day or night. Strix is also the genus of owls. Rocket Lab won't be recovering the first stage of the Electron, unlike in their previous mission, as they're still in the very early stages of booster recovery development, and it'll take some further study of the previous mission's first stage before the company will re-attempt another booster landing. This week's fourth launch will be from India, and thanks to their government's ongoing copyright claiming spree whenever anyone shows any footage of their launches, I'll just show some footage of a much better rocket company instead. <laughs> uh, the Indian rocket will be a polar satellite launch vehicle XL, carrying a CMS-01 satellite and has seen a couple of delays, so hopefully it goes ahead without a hitch this time. Whatever. I guess I'm just still salty about the copyright claims. Despite this being news coverage entirely within the confines of fair use and as stated in the- You know what? It doesn't matter. Let's just let's just move along to our next launch, which will be a SpaceX Falcon 9 flight on the 17th of December, launching from the Kennedy Space Center. On board will be a classified satellite for the United States National Reconnaissance Office, so we obviously can't talk about what it is in great detail since its identity and purpose is classified. This will be the fifth outing for this particular Falcon 9 first stage, and if all goes to plan, it'll touch down at landing zone 1 shortly after second stage separation. Next up, we'll see a Soyuz 2.1 rocket operated jointly by Ariane Space and Starsem, a French-Russian launch company. It'll be launching from the relatively new spaceport of Vostokny, which saw its first launch in 2016 and to date has only had five flights. It was built to reduce Russia's dependency on the Baikonur Cosmodrome, which is leased from the government of Kazakhstan and is currently the only Russian-operated launch site capable of launching crewed missions to the International Space Station or elsewhere. Vostokny plans to ultimately replace the role Baikonur currently serves, though this will likely take some time. Hopefully it sees its sixth launch proceed successfully, and the payload, 36 satellites for the British OneWeb constellation, reach their low Earth orbit destination as planned. Our final launch of the week will be from China and will be the very first flight of the brand new Long March 8 rocket, launching from the Wenchang Launch Complex. On board will be a Chinese Xinjishu Yanzheng technology demonstration satellite, as well as an Earth observation satellite made jointly by China and Ethiopia. The Long March 8 is exciting as it follows the SpaceX Falcon 9 design of a self-landing reusable first stage. As we all know, it took SpaceX several years to get the landing part right, but I still wish the Long March 8 all the best for its maiden voyage. But the Long March 8 is the final expected launch of the week, so now it's on to our final segment of the show, all the best historic spaceflight anniversaries set to take place over the coming days. <laughs> Our first two space anniversaries are today, December the 14th, the first of which is the 1962 Venus flyby of NASA's Mariner 2 spacecraft, which would be the first time a spacecraft flew by Venus and was the first successful planetary encounter by a robotic space probe. It was launched on August 27th in 1962 by an Atlas Agena rocket, and the primary mission objective was to receive communication from the satellite in the vicinity of Venus and perform radiometric temperature measurements of Venus itself. During the flyby, Mariner 2 scanned the planet with its pair of radiometers and discovered that Venus has cool clouds and an extremely hot surface. It wasn't just Venus that was studied though. On the way to the planet, the Mariner 2 measured solar wind, confirming measurements by Luna 1 in 1959, and also measured interplanetary dust, which turned out to be much scarcer than initially thought. 
The same day, December the 14th, but this time in 1972, astronaut Eugene Cernan became the last person to walk on the moon after he and fellow Apollo astronaut Harrison Schmidt completed their third and final moonwalk of the Apollo 17 mission. We begun covering the anniversaries associated with the Apollo 17 mission in last week's episode, so I'll stick a link on screen and in the description if you want to hear more about this mission's launch and the other milestones up to this day. Tomorrow, on the 15th of December, we'll see the anniversary of the launch of Gemini 6A, crewed by Wally Schirrer and Thomas Stafford. Shortly after launching on a Titan II rocket, the spacecraft achieved the first crewed rendezvous with another spacecraft, its sister ship Gemini 7. While the Soviet Union had previously launched pairs of Vostok spacecraft, twice in fact before, uh, these only established radio contact with each other and had no ability to adjust their orbits in order to rendezvous, coming no closer than several kilometers of each other. As you can see from these photos, Gemini 6 and 7 came to around 30 centimeters from each other and could have quite easily docked if they had been so equipped. This was a huge step in advancing the United States' spaceflight capabilities, as orbital rendezvous would be an essential component for the later Apollo moon landing missions. Also on the 15th of December, in 1970 this time, the Soviet spacecraft Venera 7 successfully lands on Venus. This would be the first successful soft landing of a spacecraft on another planet, and the first to transmit data from there back to Earth. It almost ended in disaster as its parachute failed during the descent and caused the spacecraft to enter freefall, striking the Venusian surface at around 16 meters per second, though happily it survived its landing and was able to tell us that the surface temperature of Venus was around 475 degrees Celsius, and from this, along with models of the atmosphere, scientists were able to calculate a surface pressure of 9 megapascal, or 90 bar, roughly the same pressure that's found 900 meters underwater on Earth. The mission definitively confirmed that humans cannot survive on the surface of Venus and excluded the possibility that there is any liquid water on the planet. Jumping forward to December the 17th, the Wright brothers make history in 1903 in the town of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, after making the world's first controlled, powered, heavier-than-air flight in the Wright Flyer aircraft. I know it's not strictly a space anniversary, but it was still a huge stepping stone in our journey to the stars, so it's definitely worthy of a mention. On December the 18th, Project SCORE was launched in 1958 aboard an American Atlas rocket. SCORE is an acronym that stands for Signal Communications by Orbiting Relay, and it's significant because it was the world's first purpose-built communication satellite. It would carry the first successful broadcast of a human voice from space, and the mission marked the first successful use of the Atlas as a launch vehicle. It broadcasted a Christmas message via shortwave radio by President Dwight D. Eisenhower through an onboard tape recorder. Politically, the satellite placed the United States at an even technological par with the Soviet Union as a highly functional response to the Sputnik 1 and Sputnik 2 satellites. The satellite remained in orbit for 34 days before the orbit decayed and the probe re-entered the atmosphere. Saturday the 19th of December will mark the anniversary of Apollo 17's return to Earth, successfully splashing down in the Pacific Ocean with its crew Eugene Cernan, Ronald Evans and Harrison Schmidt, ending a legendary chapter in our history. The Apollo 17 mission remains the last time humans have visited the moon. It's been fun watching the progress of this mission over the past couple of weeks, but also a little bittersweet to see it come to an end. And with the end of Apollo 17 also comes the end of this week's history segment. <laughs> And so brings an end to another episode of Space This Week. Lots of tests and maiden flights this week, from the mostly success of the Starship SN8 to the exciting prospect of the Angara A5, Rocket 3.2, and the first flight of the Long March 8. Which of the three are you most looking forward to seeing the most? Let me know down below. And of course, I must give a massive thanks to CyberGhost VPN for once again sponsoring the show. I've been using their services every day since I signed up, and I highly recommend recommend their service, it's super intuitive and dead easy to get up and running. There's now an end screen in front of you with a link to the full Space This Week playlist on the left hand side, and a link to a video from my channel that YouTube's algorithm thinks you'll like on the right hand side. There's also links to my Patreon and clothing store in the description down below if you want to support the show monetarily. Anyway, uh, that that's it. Goodbye!